Certainly. Um, my name is Mike. I'm originally from upstate New York, and uh, I moved over to China. Let's see, I went as an exchange student in the, in the mid-90s, and uh, after a few years of uh, working for consulting companies, I decided to set up my own sourcing agency, and that company is now Passage Maker, PSSChina.com, Passage Maker Sourcing Solutions, China.com, PSSChina.com to learn all about it and watch our videos or just type in Mike Bellamy on YouTube and you'll you'll find uh, Mike Bellamy China on YouTube and you'll find a bunch of videos that I've done about life in China and doing business there. If you just type Mike Bellamy, there's some famous footballers around the world that, that will pop up instead of me. Um, but long story short, for the last 20 years, I've been based in, in China. Now I'm recording from, from the US on a visit, but normally I'm in China and uh, I run the sourcing agency. We, uh, at our peak, we had 400 employees kitting products together. So not just uh, buying and selling like a trading company, but helping our clients set up dedicated assembly lines under our facility. So what we specialized in were products where the customer was hesitant to turn over the intellectual property or the designs to the suppliers. So the Chinese suppliers would deliver the components to my team, and then we would kit it together. So we're um, you know very aware of quality issues and contract issues and delivery issues. So um, I've kind of seen the good and the bad and the ugly during my 20 years in China and happy to share my experience with your viewers. Yeah, that's, that's uh, you've touched upon one um, kind of danger area. A lot of the, the people that knock on my door that I meet at the trade shows you know, they're entrepreneurs, they've got a, they're engineers, they've got a great idea, they go on Kickstarter, they get funded, they have all this money, and they assume that placing the order in China is easy and that fulfilling the order and getting the production going is, you know, just to some, slip, flip a switch. And sadly, that can, um, you know, put them out of business because they take these orders, then they can't deliver. So my advice would be, Sure, you got to focus on your product. You got to understand your customer, but give yourself some uh, window in order to get your supply chain in place. So before you start taking those orders, before you commit to things with your customers, you know, make sure that you have your suppliers qualified and they really can do what they say they can do. Because suppliers are great salespeople; they'll promise the world, uh, but it's not um, in concrete and reliable until you get that first order delivered. Sure, there's two, two issues you touched upon. One is, how do you avoid the scams? How do you avoid the bad suppliers? And the other is, how do you ensure that the supplier that you found is legitimate? Because there are suppliers who are good suppliers. I mean, they're not scams. They're real businesses, but they might not be a perfect fit for your business. So let's talk about how do we avoid scams. Then we'll talk about how to confirm that that supplier that you found that's a legitimate supplier is also a good fit for you because these are two different issues. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is that most scam artists, you know, they're not going to pay a lot of money to go to a global sources trade show. They're not going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to be listed on global sources. They're going to operate, you know, you're going to type in on Google and you're going to find them maybe on Alibaba and they're going to have some, one of those free, you know, single star listings because it doesn't cost anything. And those are the scam artists. Um, there are a lot of ways to find out if you're being scammed. The most obvious is if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, so, you know, be realistic, do your research, contact four or five suppliers, find out where the pricing is. Is it a bell curve? And, you know, four of the suppliers are right in here. And then this one supplier is way too low. Something's probably wrong. So, you know, you can do a bit of research and yeah, you can hire companies like myself. You can go to Asia Bridge Law and hire our lawyers and, and analysts to do due diligence on potential suppliers. You know, but that's gonna cost hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars. But if you wanna do it yourself, you know, ask some questions like, one, let me talk to a couple references. You know, show me some samples of the products that you're selling. You know, don't just take that fancy website um, at face value. You know, do some due diligence just like you would back home. Um, so the good news is those scam artists generally don't operate in the, uh, the, the, the global sources platform. 
But if you just go out on Google and start looking for suppliers, you almost have to assume that everybody you meet is a scam artist. So now you've, you're smart enough to avoid the scams and you've done your research and you've got it down to like five suppliers. How do you make sure that you're dealing with the best supplier from those five? Well, first I'll tell you what not to do. Don't ask all these suppliers for a quote because what'll happen is you'll get the pricing back and you'll subconsciously gravitate towards the supplier with the lowest cost. And nine times out of 10, the supplier with the lowest unit price is often the most expensive overall. You have to spend more time holding their hands. You have to fly back and forth to China to make sure they get the product right. You know, you, you, you have defects, you have returns. Those things cost the bottom line. So it's very rare that the lowest unit price means the best uh, overall pricing. So you talk to those suppliers that look legit. You visit them. You ask the tough questions like, you know, what are the lead times? Are you going to respect my intellectual property? Can I talk to some of your customers? What are the warranty issues? Do you really understand my specs? Because everybody, so many suppliers, they want your order. They'll say, sure, we can make that product. You know, one of the most dangerous questions to ask in the China game is, can you make this for me? Because everyone will say, yes, we can make it for you. You could ask a supplier, hey, you know, China, they, they put a man in space. They built the Great Wall. Yeah, they probably can do something. You know, so you could say to a supplier, hey, I want to buy the space shuttle. Yeah, with a with an enough budget and time, the supplier could make the space shuttle. But it's a lot more realistic and uh, beneficial for you to ask, have you made a space shuttle before? Show me your the space shuttle that you made for the other customer. So don't ask the question, can you make this? Ask the question, show me what you've made. So assuming that that supplier has made the something very similar or exactly what you want, then you can proceed to the nitty gritty of negotiating the price and the, the uh, terms and conditions of your contract. So uh, along the, the short answer would be, you know, avoid the scams, do your research, narrow it down to two or three potential suppliers and spend a lot of work with those potential three suppliers to find out which one is a perfect fit for you. You know, uh, don't rush in and say, okay, I've got a week to put this project together and I'm gonna deal with the first supplier that speaks English. That's real dangerous. Only if your specs are not well defined. The um, black hole that wastes, that just sucks up time and money is when you, you aren't quite sure what you're looking for. So you've got an idea about what your piece of electronics should look for and then you go to four different suppliers and they give you five different ways to make that product. You're just gonna go around in circles, you're gonna spend a lot of time and product um, you know, validation and then you have to go to lab testing and certification. And so long story short, spend a little bit of money and time up front, get your engineering package together that defines the bill of material, defines what the product's gonna look like, the material specs, it, it tells the supplier exactly what they have to make. And uh, if you have that in place, usually it's called a DFM, Design for Manufacturing Package. So your engineering package, if that's in place, then you can go to suppliers and say, what does it cost? How much time to make this? And uh, rather than asking suppliers, hey, can you make this for me? This is why, this is the reason, I'm looking for a product that does this. What design do you suggest? You know, that's going to waste a lot of time, and also you're going to run into issues of who actually owns the intellectual property. So my point is um, take a bre deep breath, maybe pay for some engineering back home or third-party engineering. Don't have the supplier do the engineering for you in most cases. Um, and then it's not so hard to find a supplier even for complex parts. I mean, so many electronics are made over here already. It is certainly possible. Yeah, it's, you need to find a good fit between your order sizes and the um, size of the supplier, what interests them. You know, a lot of buyers, especially if they're new to China, make the mistake of saying, I want to go out and find the world-class supplier, best in, best in industry, in order to make my 500 units. <laughs> Not possible. You know, th those suppliers who are best in class, their minimum order might be, you know, 5,000. 
they're not going to be interested in 500 units. And if they are interested, it's probably still your technology, not to actually make your order. So be aware that you have to be realistic with your order sizes and find a supplier that is a good fit. It's interested in that order size. Um, don't make the mistake of telling that supplier that you're going to order a million units when realistically you might only order 10,000 because the supplier is going to remember that. And when you don't order a million units, they're going to be, um, they're going to feel that they're let down. They're going to um, try to make their money other ways, maybe by borrowing your intellectual property or perhaps jacking up the price suddenly. So be open with your suppliers about your initial order size, your sampling size, your first order run, and what could happen if it takes off in the market. So, um, you know, it, it's all about finding the, the right factory for your particular size. You know, that, that's a slippery slope. It's real dangerous. If you don't know how to make your product already, um, you, now the supplier is smarter than you. Probably your customers that understand the product, they might have better knowledge about how the product should work. It's really dangerous when you're the kind of the odd man out in terms of product knowledge. So I, I think it's it, in most cases, especially if it's something proprietary or unique or new, you really got to understand your technology. The moment you go to the suppliers and say, make this, now they're making it in a way that's good for them, not necessarily what's best in class. For example, um, you know, we talk about DFM, Design for Manufacture, and when you have a third-party engineering firm, and I'm not in this line of work, so I use these third parties as well, um, they'll come up with a, a way of making a product that is most efficient. Now, when you go to the supplier and say, yeah, how would you make this? They're going to pick the bill of materials based on what they're used to working with. They might pick the product that's going to build in, I'm sorry, the, the bill of material that's going to give them the best margin, which is usually low cost bill of material and charge a little more on the assembly. Or they're going to work with sub suppliers that are family members, you know, using outdated production methods. So it can be risky when you say to the supplier, here's my idea, make it, um, because they're going to make it the way that they want to make it, not the best way to make it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a big fan of relying on my suppliers for the technology. I like to, um, define exactly what I need, then go out and find a supplier that can make it. Maybe I'm a little different than, than most people, but I've been burnt so many times with, um, trying to set up licensing agreements where my technology is used by a supplier. You know, they, they take the technology and might send it to their cousin across the street. How are you going to control who actually has access to the technology. So be very careful that your suppliers don't become future competitors. It, you know, let's assume that you're doing something complex that, um, you know, you care what batteries go into it. You care what circuitry is used. You know, if you're making a, you know, one of these fidget spinners, um, you know, with some lighting inside, okay, that's that's a dime a dozen, everybody's making that. But if you've got some new technology, um, it's proprietary, you own the IP, yeah, then you really need to know every phase of, of, of production. And granted, the suppliers may not um, share with you their sub-suppliers, but you wanna make sure that your primary supplier is responsible for his sub-suppliers and before the product ships, you can tear it apart and make sure that the bill of material matches what you expected. So you can certainly spec in um, materials and quality standards, even if you don't know who is the actual sub supplier. It's not a very transparent supply chain, unfortunately, unless you're Apple and can you know dominate the supply chain. Most of your the people watching this video are smaller than Apple, and uh, you know kind of have to give and take in exchange for. Um, lack of transparency in the supply chain, you make it up and cover your, your bases by doing some more intense uh, quality um, gates before it ships. So make sure the supplier is responsible for their sub-suppliers and their sub-suppliers, sub-suppliers. Well, you know, if you do your research up front and you, you've qualified those five vendors and you narrow it down to three, then you had discussions with the top couple of them, you'll know if it can be done or not. Um, 
you know, it's also if you're trying to make something totally unique, proprietary versus a me too product, you know, a lot of uh, the Amazon sellers, it's a race to the bottom. You find um, you want to buy, you want to control that buy box and you basically take someone else's product and you tweak it a little bit. That's a lot different. That has a different strategy than something that is proprietary and totally unique. So we could do two different video sessions here. If you're doing the Me Too products, yeah, then you can rely on the sub supplier, I'm sorry, the supplier who in theory has been making this product for someone else and you work with them and say, tweak this a little bit, you know, maybe putting in different packaging. That's a whole lot different than um, the strategies needed for creating a totally new product that the suppliers haven't made in China. So, um, you know, we have, we have to um, clarify which, which, uh, which channel you're going after. The engineering phase will um, is often tied to prototyping. So when you're paying that engineer to um, provide you with a spec sheet, you know how is this product to be assembled? What are the bill materials that go into it? The componentry? What are the standards? Um, you know, often you also go to the prototyping phase. Maybe you haven't even found your supplier yet. There are prototype shops. You know, you can make hand samples, if you will. Um, kind of workshop mentality, you know, get a couple pieces, make sure that, it, that it, everything uh, is, is fit form and function and um, validate that this idea works. Then you've got the paperwork, you've got the counter sample, then you go find some suppliers. So spend a little bit of money. If you have to spend money, it should be spent at the engineering and prototyping phase. It's a waste of money to have an idea, go to a supplier that promises they can make it, then work with them a year go through a bunch of counter samples only to find out that they can't really make it. So uh, having clear specifications is um, probably the, the money well spent. Yeah, um, yeah I'm a, I don't want this to be a sales pitch, so I'll make it really uh, simple, but I'm on the board of advisors at Asia Bridge Law. So they're a law firm that, um, has lawyers in their network that can craft a template bilingual uh, manufacturing agreement you know, for hundreds, not thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So people need to know that it's a lot more affordable to engage an English speaking lawyer in China than to try to find uh, uh, an English lawyer that in America or Canada or, or wherever in the English speaking world that understands China business and law. So, um, you know, it, you got to have a bilingual agreement. It needs to. You can't just take an American contract and put it in China. There's there's so many nuances, jurisdiction, penalty clauses that have to be adjusted for China. So the good news is that it's very affordable to to find um, English speaking Chinese lawyers. Um, the bad news is that it's not as simple as just taking your template and getting it translated, or just taking your English template from back home that's used in North America and having the Chinese suppliers sign it. Um, there's just, there's so many aspects that need to be adjusted for China. Oh, and some more good news is that if you have a proper contract, um, you know, you're, you're one, you're setting the tone with the supplier that you're serious and you're professional. A, a lot of suppliers that aren't sure if they can actually make their product um, and you're not asking them to sign a contract, what's their risk? Now you put a nice contract in front of them that's tied to the quality specs and say, this is what we need to have made. If you miss the target date, then we get X um, rebate or X percent discount. You know, the, there, are, there are ramifications for their failure to deliver and a legitimate supplier won't be intimidated by that. But the jokers that are out there parading as legitimate suppliers, um, you know, they, they, they might run away when you present a contract. So a contract sets the tone and uh, God forbid something goes wrong, you have some, um, you know, you have a me you have a, a way of of getting compensation. If you don't have a contract in place and your order ships late, um, you know, good luck getting funds returned. In my 20 years in China, I've never had a supplier come to me and say, "Mike, we missed your order. Uh, let us pay for replacement parts via Air Express." Never until I started using contracts and saying. Yes. All right. You missed the date. 
now I need you to pay for the, the, the FedEx charges or give me that 3% discount. So you're crazy to do business in China without a contract. Um, some people, the old mentality like 15 years ago is, oh, contracts don't mean anything in China. Well, maybe 15 years ago that was the case, but now contracts mean something. They're enforceable and uh, they're affordable. So you're crazy not to have a bilingual contract. Sure, you, you have to pick one of the languages to, to be the primary language. It can be English. You know, a, um, an English only contract signed by both parties um, is enforceable. The problem is um, the defendant, say you have to take that supplier to court. Now the court is going to um, appoint a translator. There's additional cost, additional time. Also, the seller will pick every little word in the translation and say, oh, no, that's not a proper translation. And they'll just delay the, the court hearing forever. So when you have a, a Chinese language contract in China, you know, it goes to court, things go fast, you win or lose. So um, I like to have my, con my contracts bilingual, but I don't have an English contract and a Chinese contract because um, it's too easy for the, the, um, the revisions to get messed up. So what I like to do is I have one contract. It has a, a couple sentences in Chinese, a couple sentences in English. Um, the English is more a translation to make sure that the English speaking customers and staff that we have um, are up to speed, but the the contract language in terms of um, you know the if it ever goes to court is in Chinese. So all of my contracts are in Chinese. Yeah. So some people make the mistake of having an English contract and a Chinese contract, and then uh, signature on both. You know, it's th then if there is ever a in this instance where you need to go to court because the supplier made a mistake, there's there might be some difference between the two and you'll fight over the translation. Also, if you have an English only copy, the Chinese court is not going to um, tr do everything in English just for you. If the language of the court is Chinese, so it'll have to be translated. And what will happen is the defendant will nitpick over every word's translation and that'll take a bunch of time and money to get it translated in a way that is mutually agreeable. And then by that time, the supplier is out of business and you'll never get your money back. So it just makes total sense and it'll save you money and time to use a Chinese language contract and have, have it translated in English for your reference, not as English as the, the, the language of the agreement. So my contracts, instead of two, an English version, a Chinese version, Generally, I have a sentence in, in uh, Chinese, legally binding, then the English translation for my reference and my customer's reference. And, um, of course, the jurisdiction is China as well. Uh, people think that, oh, I'll have an English language contract and the jurisdiction will be America so that if the supplier messes up, I can bring them to America and have a, the, home, the home court advantage. You know, good luck getting a supplier out of China into the U.S., also, um, if you do win in a court in America, it's not like it's enforceable in China. Um, <laughs> no. And also, um, you know, the assets of the seller are in China. So you want your, in my opinion, and I'm not a lawyer, but this is just what served me well for 20 years. I like to have the jurisdiction in the location where the seller has their assets. So if I have to go after them, um, I'm going where the money is. It doesn't make sense to try to bring an in a company to America, um, and then their assets are in China. Probably your lawyer in America who might say, "Oh, the jurisdiction's got to be in the U.S." But ask yourself, you know, are, are they charging you five hundred dollars <laughs> an hour? <laughs> and so that's why they want the court case in the U.S. But if you win, you know, what's what's the best case situation? Are you going to get any money back? from a seller that doesn't have assets in the US and even how would you get that seller into the US? So, you know, you want to deal with Chinese lawyers who are experienced with China and it's a lot easier to find them in China than, than in America. There are some, but uh, find yourself a good uh, um, 
English speaking Chinese lawyer is my suggestion. Yeah, since a lot of your audience have proprietary ideas, they own technology, they have intellectual property, um, a common mistake is to think, all right, let's go open the market and then we'll get our technology re registered. Yeah, we own the IP in America, we don't need to do it in China. That's really dangerous um, because China is first to register rather than first to market. So say that you, you have, uh, you're have you getting your product made in China, you're even selling it in China. Then your competitor or your supplier realizes that you haven't registered that brand name or that trademark or that patent. They can go to Beijing, spend a little bit of money, hire a patent attorney, and now they own the technology and you got to pay them to get your own technology back. So my advice is even before you start uh, placing a purchase order in China, if you have something worth protecting, a brand name, a logo, let alone you know, your, your patents, get that stuff protected in China uh, first. And so it's under your name. Then that, that's going to save a lot of time and money and headaches. Don't go cheap with the uh, ownership of your intellectual property. Don't go cheap on your engineering. Spend your time and your due diligence to find the right supplier. You do those three things and you're probably knocking out 90% of the headaches and the, the mistakes that, that new to China um, buyers encounter. Okay, and if uh, your audience wants to to learn more about me or watch some of the other videos that I've done, I think I have about 25 hours worth of videos on my YouTube channel. So just type in Mike Bellamy China, Mike plus Bellamy plus China um, on YouTube. You'll find a couple of my channels. You can also find more information at the China Sourcing Academy where I host a number of seminars about doing business in China, China Sourcing Academy. And uh, my main business is Passage Maker and Asia Bridge Law is the uh, law firm where I'm on the board of advisors. So um, I'd be happy to take uh, questions that your audience may have. Just shoot me an email. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find.